This comes from the Conway Institute at University College Dublin in Ireland. And all of you, you here, hey Des, come here, don't be shy. <laughs> all of you. <laughs> I mean, you all have heard of Clustal, I mean, except if you were on Desert Island, and even Desert Islands, you know, have internet, so, I mean, <laughs> so basically, I mean, that's one of the things he has done, he has worked on other things, and, uh, I mean, but it, basically, one of the major achievements that people have all heard about is all of the different versions of Clustal that have been created thanks to this. I put as link, and you tell me if it's wrong, Trinity Dublin, EMBL, because he was at EMBL in Cork. And as uh, BioLinks, that uh, Des has worked, of course, with Paul Sharp, where he did his uh, postdoc, and he has worked at EMBL with Runner Foods, with Alan Blisby, he has developed a version of uh, Clustal with Julie Thompson, with Toby Gibson, and uh, one of his uh, PhD students was Cedric Notre Dame. So all of those people have been, I mean, uh, linked biologically into the bioinformatic world with it. There's just one thing, when I was preparing the presentation of the speaker, I just realized that I was almost responsible for Clustal not existing. I mean, not, I mean, stopping to exist, sorry. I found this email of January 1990. And what happened, there was a mail which came up from Intelligenetic asking everyone to delete all copies of Clustals on every computers around the world, people should not keep Clustal because it was no proprietary to Intelligenetics. And I was indirectly responsible for that because I was, I mean, uh, trying to get Clustal to be in PCG. It was the best and only, not it was the best, but the only program you could do multiple alignment on a PC at that time. And I wanted it in PCG. So I asked that Intelligenetic negotiate with us that we could use it. And of course, company being like what they are, the things they did want, was that they wanted to have exclusive right. So they thought they had exclusive right and want to ask everyone to delete it. And we fought against it. And happily, it was won. And Cluster is here for everyone to use. So we're not waiting for anything last. I will need this to start this talk. Okay, thank you, Amos. Uh, I'd like to say what a, a privilege and an honor it, it is to be here uh, at this extraordinary meeting. Uh, I can, I can, the, this story, the story that Amos just told is, is exactly true, and I can continue that story during my talk. That was responsible for Clustal V, which was written in C, so I'll get, I'll get to that in a moment. But, uh, uh, Clustal is now 18 years old. This is not nearly as impressive as, or as in, an important, an achievement as Swisspot being 20 years old. Uh, but when I said this to Amos, Amos said, ah, so in two years' time you can invite us all to. And I said, no, 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 I can't invite you all to Brazil. So then, but Amos said, no, but maybe uh, I could invite you all to Dublin. So if I can get some Swiss people to organize a meeting in Dublin, um, I can come and give a, a keynote at this. But anyway, Clustal is 18 years old. Uh, which is slightly astonishing for me, considering how it started. It, it, uh, at various stages over the 18 years, I assumed that the, the program would cease to exist because of other better programs coming along, but it is still alive. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Clustal for about 20 minutes and then about five minutes about multivariate analysis, which is a little bit of a tangent, but it's multivariate analysis of microarrays, uh, just to try to show you some pretty pictures, show you some colors. So this, believe it or not, is a multiple alignment. Every day, Swiss Pod annotators make multiple alignments. All over the world, people make them. The reason I wanted to make multiple alignments was because I was interested in phylogen phylogenetic analysis. Uh, but people use multiple alignments for all kinds of different purposes. And I uh, needed to make multiple alignments, and I was sick of using WordStar, uh, which, which is a word processing program before Microsoft Word. And I, you were lucky if you had word start because otherwise you had to use a line editor. So this is extremely tedious. This is an alignment of a famous globin benchmark alignment of, of some globins, which I first saw Jeff Barton use. So, but anyway, that's a multiple alignment. How come it was so difficult to do this automatically back in the 80s, back in 1986, 87, when I first tried to do this? And if you just want to align two sequences, then everyone knows how to do this. This is the most famous bioinformatics paper uh, of all time by Needleman and Wunsch. If you have two sequences, there's an n-squared algorithm 
uh, which can align those two sequences. When I first did this in one second, maybe two or three seconds on a PC, a very old IBM PC. And this can be generalized to any number of sequences you like in principle, but then the time and the memory that you need are proportional or, or ex exponential with the number of sequences. And so if you then try to do this globe in alignment using full dynamic programming, if it takes one second to do two sequences, which it was when I first did this, and if you simply multiply the numbers up, if this alignment is 150 residues long, and if you multiply uh, by 150 every time you want to align another sequence, then the times get initially not so bad, after a while it gets a little bit slower, then it gets, then you need graduate students. Uh, uh, then you need um, a career just to do one alignment, and then this becomes impossible. And you might say, ah, but this is because you've got a crappy old Irish computer because it's very primitive. Now we've got computers thousands of times faster, but then you still cannot align 12 sequences. It's still impossible. So how do you do this? And it turns out there are many ways of doing it. In fact, well, many, many people had suggested all kinds of different ways of doing it, but none of the suggestions seem to work in practice or none of them are known could find anything that really seemed to be satisfactory in practice until 1987. Uh, when Feng and Doolittle wrote a paper where they described what they called progressive alignment, but they did not invent progressive alignment. They invented the name progressive alignment. But they referred to an earlier paper by Pauline Hokeweg and Bert Hesper in Utrecht in the Netherlands, which described progressive alignment. But the reason that no one knew of this paper was because no one knew how to pronounce this name. And so this paper became hidden in the literature, but they described more or less progressive alignment. And Willie Taylor uh, also uh, described uh, a, a very similar algorithm in at the same time as Feng and Doolittle, but the details in that are actually closer to what we now think of as progressive alignment. And there was another method by Barton and Sternberg, which is not really progressive alignment, but is very similar. This all, these also came out at the same time. And what you do is, what, what all of this is, it's a greedy algorithm where People had realized since David Sankoff that making a phylogenetic tree and a multiple alignment are very similar algorithmically. And in fact, maybe you should try to do both at the same time, but then it's really uncomputable. Really, really, really uncomputable. Uh, but if you have a phylogenetic tree, you can use this to then help you make a multiple alignment by joining the sequences together and keeping them fixed. So you, you join the two more similar sequences. To, I should stop pointing. This is very silly. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you cannot see what I'm pointing at. So you, 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 you join the two closest sequences together using dynamic programming. It takes one second. You join the next two together. That takes one second. You join the beta globins with the alpha globins. That takes one second. So in three seconds already you have four sequences aligned and so on. And this then allows you to make alignments of thousands of sequences. And this uh, hidden inside tea coffee and probcons and all kinds of other methods and inside Clustal is what most people use when they're doing multiple alignments. Not everyone. There are other ways of doing it now. Uh, and I then wrote a program called Clustal. Uh, I, I, as I said, I was certainly not the first to make a multiple alignment program. Uh, but uh, uh, it, uh, the first version of it, in fact, was as a kind of strange origin. Uh, and at the very first version, I, uh, we only had PCs in the lab. We only had easy access to PCs. These were old IBM PCs with 8088 and 8086 processors. So the very first version was written in Microsoft Fortran for MS-DOS, if you can imagine such a thing. And it was a very good compiler. This is before Microsoft tried to take over the world. It's actually a, an industrial strength Fortran 77 compiler. Um, and this was difficult because some of the algorithms that you have to use to do this are recursive, but Amos already knew how to do... The Myers and Miller algorithm was extremely difficult to do in Fortran. But Amos already knew how to do this in BASIC, which is even more impressive. But anyway, there were four PC programs, plus 1, 2, 3, and 4, um, which you had to run one after another. And then this was, it became part of PC Gene, and then we had these problems that Amos described. So in the meantime, a guy called Alan Bleasby, who is now, uh, he's part of MBOSS, the MBOSS project, and he's at, at the ABI, he translated all of Clustal into C without telling me. And I heard about this, and I said, why don't we collaborate? And he agreed. And so this then became Clustal V, which was then a C translation uh, of, uh, uh, of Clustal, and it was all in one program, and I used a Roman numeral V to try to make it look sophisticated after Clustal 1, 2, 3, and 4. 
And then later, in, still in EMBL Heidelberg, I met Toby Gibson, who had an amazing programmer called Julie Thompson, who's still working on multiple alignment, but now in Strasbourg. And we collaborated together to make Clustal W and later Clustal X, which is the same with a graphical interface. And I'll tell you about Clustal W and Clustal X version 2 in a little bit. This is a project that is going on in the lab just now. Uh, and so it's been sort of remarkable as to how... I, I, I give the citation thing here. Citations do not measure importance or wisdom or quality. But for a tool like this, this is a way where I can prove to the people that I beg to give me money to develop this, and sometimes it's very hard to get money for development of, of tools, that this program is very widely used. So as to why this program is very widely used, sometimes it amazes me as to why they use this program rather than others. And the reasons are nothing to do with science. One reason is that before I uh, started writing Clustal, I was heavily influenced by the Fast A package, by the first Fast A package, or, or by Fast P, I think. Uh, where the very first homology search that I did using Fast P was 10 minutes after opening the envelope from Bill Pearson with the floppy disks inside. So Fast P allowed you to do homology searches on a PC quickly, and it gave very good results, and it was self-explanatory to use. And that is what we tried to do in Clustal. Uh, and it sounds so simple and so sensible to do, it actually takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. But because of this, Clustal has been very widely used. There are other programs out there that are more accurate, and that do some cleverer things. But anyway, Clustal is still widely used. Um, this is an unusual photograph I suppose to show in a talk on multiple alignments. It's me standing outside a public house or bar. It would be less unusual, I suppose, if I was standing inside the bar. Uh, Michael Ashburn has been inside that bar. That's Kennedy's. Just, just been, only once, I hasten to add. That's Kennedy's beside the genetics department in Trinity College in Dublin. Uh, and the legend has it that this is where I wrote Clustal. This is completely untrue. I cannot even read email after alcohol, never mind write Fortran. Uh, but this is the, the pub where well, we used to go after, to celebrate getting Clustal like papers accepted or whatever. So this was, so the, the legend is not true, but anyway, it's a nice photograph. And in case you're wondering, this finger here is the finger of Alvis Plasma, who's head of uh, microarray research at, at the EBI, which shows how well connected I am in the microarray world. It's not just multiple alignments, it's also microarrays. So, uh, uh, anyway, uh, that's a long story. How come a Latvian was photographing me outside the a pub in Dublin? But uh, that's a long story. Uh, okay, so roughly that's the story up until 1994. So up until 1994, we had various versions of Clustal and various other multiple alignment programs. Uh, what has happened since then? An awful lot has happened, but I'll just show you a couple of slides to pick out a couple of things that are kind of uh, well important or important to me or things that influence me. One crucial early thing, this is something that people don't uh, maybe take very seriously, it's also something that's quite difficult to do, but it was the production of benchmarks. Before benchmarks for multiple alignment, it was common for people to write, to produce yet another progressive alignment program with dubious claims as to how well they worked or how well they didn't work uh, or whatever. Uh, but the benchmarks simplified a lot of the literature. It meant that if you wanted to produce a multiple alignment program, you should at least test it on some proteins. These benchmarks are not ideal. This is not the end of the story. There are many issues with benchmarks and many problems. They generate as many problems as they solve sometimes. But uh, the benchmarks have made it problem possible to at least have football matches between programs, to compare programs in different ways. The first benchmarks we ever used were from Jeff Barton and Mike Sternberg. They had a paper with a, a, gl a, a globin alignment and an immunoglobulin alignment. Uh, Marcy McClure, Walter Fitch had a small paper with some test alignments, but these are too few. Uh, uh, in an early paper with Cedric Notre Dame, Cedric used uh, a series of, of alignments from structure superpositions from Lisa Holmes, DALI, or 3D ALI, one, one of her databases. But the first real collection of benchmarks specifically designed for multiple alignment was Julie Thompson Bally Base. And this is still an important benchmark. Uh, it is not without issues, it is not perfect. Uh, there, there are many problems with Bally Base, but it's still a very important uh, uh, set of benchmarks. And, and as I say, it was specifically designed for multiple alignment, which makes it very powerful. It has features that the other benchmarks don't have. Um, Homestrad and Oxbench are based fairly directly on PDB files, PDB structures, uh, and so on and so forth. There are other benchmarks. Um, you don't have to have a pre-made multiple alignment in order to use PDB files for benchmarks. And so Cedric, has a, Notre Dame again, has a method called APDB. But again, you do need 
protein structures. And so that means that this, these benchmarks don't cover the full universe of proteins. There are a whole load of proteins in Swiss pot that are not covered by these benchmarks because you don't have PDB files for lots of proteins. Um, you can also get benchmarks for RNA. There's a recent paper, Braly based by Paul Gardner, Andreas Boom, and I don't know how to pronounce this name, I'm afraid. It's a recent paper. Anyway, if anyone knows how to pronounce that name, I'd be interested in, 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 in knowing. Uh, but anyway, this is for, uh, ripe, this is for structural RNAs. Uh, because even though this is Swiss, but RNA is still very important and still very uh, popular. So, which method is best, and of all the programs? So, is it Clustal? And the answer to that is not since the mid-90s, not for about 10 years. Clustal has not been the best method in terms of accuracy. So, the main reason that people use Clustal is because it's cheap, it works on PCs, it's user-friendly, all of that stuff. In terms of sheer accuracy, though, there are other programs but they are not necessarily all easy to use. Um, MSA has been around since 1989. Uh, that does a guaranteed multiple alignment, but only for very small numbers of sequences. It's a very, very clever piece of work. Uh, and the alignments from this are better than the alignments from Clustel, clearly, as measured on the benchmarks, but only for small numbers of sequences. There are variations. You can take the objective function in MSA and optimize it using a genetic algorithm or iteration or other methods. But these still only work for small numbers of sequences. You're talking about 10, 20, maybe 30. Uh, so these are quite specialized tools, even though the alignments are good. Uh, tea Coffee from Cedric Notre Dame. This was the first program that I saw. So he, did, he started this work when he's doing his PhD with me. But this is the first program that I saw that always and consistently beat Clustal and beat Clustal easily. And it still does to, to this day. But Cedric is going to tell you all about that in his talk. Uh, and uh, tea coffee has variations which are very powerful and in the way that you can incorporate structural information and so on, which makes tea coffee a very powerful bag of tricks. But tea coffee, again, it works up to about 100 sequences fairly easily. Beyond that, it becomes quite demanding in resources. But that's still a lot more sequences than you can align with, with, with the MSA. More recently, over the last four or five years, uh, MAFT from Kato in Japan uh, is a very powerful, very flexible collection of progressive alignment programs with all kinds of bells and whistles. And Muscle by Bob Edgar from two years ago. Muscle works extremely well on the benchmarks uh, and is extremely fast. But if you deviate from the benchmarks, it doesn't necessarily do as well. Sometimes Clustal can still beat Muscle, uh, depending on the types of sequences that you use. But nonetheless, Muscle is very fast and very slick. Uh, and it came out just two years ago. It was announced at the ISMB in Glasgow two years ago. And Probcons, uh, which I haven't read because Probcons is a very intimidating program. This is powerful. This is a very accurate program. It's quite difficult to beat. Probcons is essentially tea coffee with probabilities. Uh, so, and it did, 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 this was done by uh, it's, it's Seraphine Batoglu's group, uh, which I think, I, look, I think I've spelled that correctly. Anyway, but only for global protein alignments. Oddly enough, and to my astonishment, for ribosomal RNA, Clustal does very well. And that is almost an accident. At one stage of my life, I spent about two years making alignments of ribosomal RNAs, of small serving ribosomal RNA sequences, and staring at them and night and day. It's not a healthy thing to do. Uh, so Clustal has been tried on ribosomal RNAs, but it does well on the RNA benchmarks, uh, which is a, a, an interesting thing. But also, uh, the benchmarks tend to be of proteins the same length. If you put in multi-domain proteins with big bits missing or rearranged, then the order can change here. Then sometimes Clustal does quite well, or sometimes other programs do well. Tea coffee tends to be very good if you've got long insertions and deletions. Uh, so what about Clustal W and Clustal X version 2? Everyone thought we'd bring in a new letter, but this is getting a bit... I, we couldn't think of a letter witty enough to have a new letter, so it's going to be Clustal W and Clustal X version 2. Um, I am not religious but I am Irish, and I am reliably informed that if you want to make God laugh, you make plans. So the pl I hope he's not laughing too much, but the plan is that uh, this will be announced sometime early next year, where right now the code is being rewritten into C++, just to make it more manageable, but also with a more up-to-date graphics toolkit, so that we can bring out a, a cluster for every new version of Windows and every new Macintosh operating system. Right now, that's killing us with the existing cluster X. That is, that's hard to do. That is nearly complete. We now have cluster W in C++. 
and Cluster X will be within a few months, I hope. Uh, we would like to increase the accuracy of, of, of Cluster. We won't be able to get the accuracy up to, up to Probcons or even Tea Coffee, or, or we won't be able to get the accuracy up to Tea Coffee standards. But there are some simple and fast and easy things that we can do uh, to increase the accuracy, especially now that computers have become so fast. Computing power is now cheap. These laptops here are unbelievably powerful compared to what I first wrote Clustel on. Uh, so we want to make Clustel more accurate and also to reduce the run times. For alignment sets of less than 100 sequences, the run times don't really matter. Uh, computers are now so fast, you just press return and it happens quite quickly. But if you want to align 10,000 sequences, it sounds a bit crazy that you would even want to do that, or that you would want to even look at the answer. But some people do want to do that. So we are interested in ways of dramatically reducing the progressive part, or the, 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 especially the clustering part uh, of cluster, in order to make it possible to do very, very large alignments. Uh, so that's cluster. So for the second part of my talk, this is just uh, one little story uh, from multivariate analysis. Uh, for my PhD, uh, I did multivariate anal analysis where I tried to classify different insects based on morphology. This is like a, it's like a, a weird confession to make at a Swiss plot meeting, but I used to be an insect taxonomist a long time ago. Uh, maybe I still am. Uh, and we used multivariate analysis to do this. And we still use multivariate analysis to look at microarrays and now to look at multiple alignments. And uh, the methods that I'm going to tell you about, I'm going, basically going to very briefly tell you about one method, came from this package, where this is a package by Jean Thielouz, uh, in Lyon, in France, uh, he's an ecologist, and he made an amazing package called AID4, or AD4, which has every conceivable and imaginable type of clustering and multivariate analysis, uh, and even ones that you can't even imagine. They're so unimaginably peculiar and specific to particular problems. And we had a look inside this package. This guy is a he's in the group or in the main group, or he's a collaborator with Manolo Gouy and Guy Perrier, who I've been collaborating with for many years. And so we had a look inside this package to see if we could use any of this for looking at microarrays initially. And inside here, there were two methods that were particularly useful and powerful for looking at microarrays, and were particularly robust when you have too many variables and not enough cases, which is usually what you have with microarrays. And one of them is something called between-group analysis, which I'm going to show you applied to a multiple alignment in the last couple of pictures here. And this essentially is a way of doing correspondence analysis or principal components analysis, but supervised. When you do a, a principal components analysis, the analysis tells you what it finds. It shows you the biggest trends in the data. But it may not necessarily reflect what you are really interested in. It, it may do, or you may have to go digging through eigenvectors. Uh, but if you do it supervised, you say what you're interested in, and the analysis will try to show you pictures corresponding to that. And we've been using this the second method I'm not going to tell you anything about, but we've been using these for proteomics data, for microarrays, for transcription factor binding site data, for trying to integrate between the two. Uh, and just recently, we decided to do this on multiple alignments because that's what I've been working on for 20 years. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, uh, these methods, we, we combined them together in a small OR package, uh, which was published in Bioinformatics a year ago. Uh, so you can get these methods uh, to run on, on, on your own data sets. Uh, this was a collaboration with Jean Thielouz, ah, sorry, pictures, with Jean Thielouz, uh, who was on the top, and Guy Perrier and Adrian Colham, who was a postdoc in my group at the time. So, why would you use PCA, Principal Components Analysis, for sequences? Uh, we saw an example t this morning from Kenta Nakai, who showed a, a PCA diagram. So, most of us are very familiar with these. Uh, there are various reasons for doing it. In general, it gives you a different way of looking at the relationships between the sequences than what you normally get from a phylogenetic tree or from cluster analysis. It can show you things that cluster analysis can hide or miss. Uh, and it's been, it's been described many times for analyzing sequences. Chris Sander um, used it for, with Alfonso Valencia and Geo Cazari to spot functional residues in multiple alignments. Um, you, can, you can even get it as part of the JALView package. Jeff Barton's JALView package. It even has a PCA option inside it. Uh, so it's very easy to do, but it's kind of neglected. It's kind of overlooked. Uh, why would you do a supervised PCA or, 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 a, or, or a correspondence analysis? 
Here's a recent example. These examples are, are well known. They've been going back to the Sandra paper, the, 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 the Valencia paper I showed you a moment ago. But this is from this year in bioinformatics. Uh, again, from Alfonso Valencia's group. And this is a famous example where you've got malate and lactate dehydrogenases. Amos can tell you all of, all of the details. I just am nodding his head. <laughs> I, I guess any alignment I would have put up, you would have nodded your head. But anyway. <laughs> but uh, the malate and the lactate dehydrogenases, uh, they have different substrate specificities. But the substrate... One minute. Okay. Okay. They have different substrate specificities uh, depending, uh, uh, depending on whether they, they, they bind malate or lactate. But this does not follow a simple split in the phylogenetic tree. Okay, it's a bit convoluted. So if you want to try to find the residues that are important in this, you have to do something a little bit different. A normal phylogenetic analysis is a little bit diff difficult. So we applied between group analysis to this, where if I could describe in one cartoon what it does, I am a biologist, I'm not a statistician. So the statistics invo involved in between group analysis, it gets very technical, but in a word, if I could just some describe it like this, if you have 50 sequences, if you do a correspondence analysis, you get a two-dimensional plot with 50 sequences. But if you have four groups, what happens is the analysis is done on the four groups, on the centroids of the four groups. So these are plotted out in the low-dimensional representation. Okay? So the analysis is forces these apart such that they have maximum between group variances and minimum within group variances. And you can then come along with the raw data and plot the raw data points on the same figure and this gives you an idea as to how well the groups of sequences split from each other according to the splits that you have specified in your analysis. So, here's an example. This is from uh, Rob Russell uh, and uh, Hannah and Halley uh, from uh, a few years ago Jay in Jane Mulbayol. It's a Syrian protease example. I almost didn't nod his head for this one. I didn't see him nodding his head. But I'm sure you know this one. This is another well-known example. Um, and uh, their example was they, they tried to find the functional residues that are responsible for, se for, for specifying whether you're a chymotrypsin, uh, a trypsin, or an elastase. And so this then is a BGA, a between group analysis using correspondence analysis. And on the top panel, we have all of the sequences, uh, which separate out into, into the three groups, more or less. And on the bottom panel, each dot is one residue. The variables in this case are the amino acids in the columns. Each variable is one amino acid in one column. It's a binary variable. It's a very stupid variable. It's not very biochemically sophisticated. And put it, for, for, um, for example, uh, so 275G means glycine at position 275 in the alignment. And because it's correspondence analysis, if you want to ask why, what residues are responsible for separating the trypsins from the chymotrypsins, then you pick the dots, or the, the end dots are labeled here, the, each one of these is, is, a, is a variable. They're the dots that are furthest out from the origin in the same direction as the trypsins. And the one that's furthest out is 229D, so that's whether or not you have a D at position 229. Uh, and that, this is a figure from the, the Hannon, Halley and Barton paper. So this is one of the six or seven residues that they picked out as being responsible for specificity in the elastases. If you just want to pick out specificity, there are probably more powerful methods, including one that Chris Sander will tell you about uh, later at this meeting, using information theory or other methods. But this is just a very powerful visualization method for looking at multiple alignments. And if you don't like the binary yes-no correspondence analysis variables, which are very stupid, uh, where uh, cor the, this method doesn't know that an E is very similar to a D and much more similar than a, than a W, then you can do it with principal components analysis and then you can use um, uh, any, any kind of variables you like, such as amino acid properties. Uh, but in this case, the pictures aren't as pretty. Uh, correspondence analysis gives you very remarkable, very beautiful pictures uh, with the sequences and the residues plotted on the same picture. Um, here is the same set of sequences analyzed with between group analysis. And I'd better finish. Um, okay, it's just another way of looking at it, and you can see other residue positions. Let's uh, not go through that. And you can pick out other. Uh, another position, it's okay. Uh, and so right now, uh, we're looking at how to use sequence weighting and pseudo counts with this in order to improve it. And that's it. Uh, they've not, well, I better not acknowledge people. So our ongoing Clustal collaborators are Toby and Julie Thompson. Six years of Clustal was done while he was working for Graham Cameron. Uh, and initially started off when he was working for Paul Sharp. Uh, the BGA stuff uh, it was done by Adrian Callahan, a postdoc in my group, and two postgrads, Ian Jeffrey and Ailish Fagan and my collaborators from Lyon, 
and the uh, multivari this sequence BGA stuff was done by Ian Wallace, who is here, uh, and Plustel version 2 is mainly being done by Mark Larkin in my group. So, thank you. So, So, we just have time for one or two questions. Oh, that means I'm finished. Okay. So, it's uh, just a developer question. You said that uh, the version 2 of Cluster W and Cluster X will be uh, re engineered uh, in an object oriented manner. Uh, can we expect to have um, an API then? Yeah, I mean, uh, one way to, to, to directly call the engine uh, without. Uh, we, we need an API for our own purposes. So, in order to put in. We need this, so there's no reason why we couldn't release this. Uh, so uh, the answer is yes, in principle. When when does that when we will actually release it, I don't know. But uh, yeah, that would, that would make sense. So more questions? Okay, I think we should thank this again.